on September 10th, 1999. Eric Bischoff was sent home. Turner executive said, Eric, you've done a lot of great shit. We fired some of the wrestlers. You haven't turned things around. Ratings are in the goddamn shitter. We're making a change. Go home. Stop. Don't do this anymore. We'll fix this. We're going to hire Vince Swerve Bro Russo, bro, to turn things around. We're going to bring in Ed Ferrara, the man that made fun of JR's Bell's palsy. Oh, that piece of shit deserves to be slapped routinely and constantly until he isn't able to fucking talk ever again. Fuck you, Ed Ferrara. But don't worry, Vince Russo was absolutely going to turn WCW around. He was going to turn around right into the goddamn path of an oncoming train. <laughs> this pay-per-view, this pay-per-view was so... <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, swerves and turns and run-ins and referee bumps and the blood wasn't even the problem. Sid was doing everything he could to put over Bill Goldberg. Oh, oh Vince Russo, you fucking cancerous tumor of a human being. How dare you? How dare you say that you were ever a positive influence on professional wrestling? The only reason that Vince Russo was ever considered to be anything beneficial to wrestling is because Vince McMahon, the actual Vince in wrestling that did something good for wrestling, despite the fact that he had a lot of other transgressions that he is absolutely paying for and deserves to pay for ten times over, but Vince McMahon took wrestling to new heights, and Vince Russo took WCW down into the depths of hell. That's a swerve for you, you fucking goddamn cancerous tumor. You never deserve to breathe properly again. I'm John Rentham with the Retro View of WCW Halloween Havoc 1999. Oh, where to goddamn start with this? I believe it was October 5th, 99, where Vince Russo came over with Ed Ferrara for about 750 grand a year. They paid that guy way more than they paid some of their wrestlers because he's the guy that's going to save our company. Let's be honest. Vince Russo did not kill WCW. Let me make that clear right now. But as Bret Hart said, one, he called him a piece of shit, said, I don't think you can tell wrestlers what to do if you've never been in the ring. You know, how many matches has Vince Russo had in front of crowds? You know, you might think that you know what you're talking about, but a lot of times you have no idea. Brett had a lot of great ideas when it came to wrestling, and Vince Russo's best ideas were filtered through Vince McMahon, and this show proves why Vince McMahon, <coughs> for all his faults, helped basically reshape Russo's best ideas into something at least halfway presentable. And he still allowed a lot of his shit on there, but holy shit, the tagline, the tagline for this, and I do want to say, by the way, just in case you really want to see me absolutely lose it, <laughs> check out my Retro View series from the reboot episode of WCW Nitro all the way through to the end. Even after Vince Russo was sent home, WCW is spiraling out of control. There's going to be some facts and figures and some talk because this pay-per-view was so goddamn terrible. I mean, not that WCW's pay-per-views in 1999 were all that great. Great American Bash 99, Bash of the Beach 99, Road Wild 99, Fall Brawl, which was the first pay-per-view not run by Eric Bischoff in a number of years. But the tagline for this, the stuff of nightmares, or the stuff nightmares are made of when our inner animals come out to play. That was a tagline for this, by the way. It was at the MGM Grand Garden Arena, which... By the way, it hosted the 96 through 2000 events. They didn't even get close to having the 2001 event take place at the MGM Grand Garden Arena because they were out of business by March, late March of 2001. <laughs> so let's do some facts and figures just for fun because talking about this pay-per-view, you know, without diving into a few neat little tidbits is probably going to fry my brain and melt it even more than it already has been. And let me tell you, this pay-per-view I, I saw it before i've seen it a couple times and it somehow gets worse with the with more context it's and, and even if you have context there's still so much out of context bullshit taking place even if you watch the television from say road wild 99 or even from just fall brawl 99 to this pay-per-view you still wouldn't have a goddamn clue what's going on because even with the even if Bischoff was left in charge, I think the things would spiral out of control, and they got even worse. Because Turner Brass really thought that Vince Russo was going to be beneficial for their company. So the 1996 event 
had a crowd of about 10,000 people and 250,000 buys. Certainly not bad. That was on the rise. That was equal to Bash at the Beach 96, where Hulk Hogan introduced a new world order of wrestling, brother. 1997, beefed it up about 2,457 more fans, so pretty goddamn big crowd right there. <laughs> and I believe the Grand Garden Arena actually has a capacity of around 17 to 18,000 people. And 405,000 buys for 1997. They were soaring up, and then they went to Starcade 97, and then that finish made it a guarantee they were never going to hit 750,000 or whatever it was buys ever again. 1998, they were down about 1,800 people, 10,663, 310,000 buys. So, okay, bigger than 96, down from 97, but that's all right. Let's see what 1999 did. They... We're down to 8,464 fans, and you could tell that this crowd was more silent because the entire upper deck was totally curtained off. Or it was just totally darkened, and like the few fans that were up there were like, yeah, we're here too. 230,000 buys. By the way, these numbers uh, came from WrestleNomics, and uh, Brandon Thurston and the crew do a great job there. No, I was not asked to plug that. They don't even know who the fuck I am, but I feel that getting them, getting these facts and figures from certain sources means that they deserve to be plugged because they do a lot of great work and a lot of really great research finding out this stuff. So let's talk about 2000. Um, just briefly, I did retroview that when I did the aforementioned reboot all the way to the end series. I lost my shit several times. 7,582 fans. Okay, they only lost about 900 fans and they lost 160,000 pay-per-view buys. They were down to 70,000 pay-per-view buys. And Fun fact, this was the last WCW pay-per-view to hit over 200,000 pay-per-view buys. There was only one pay-per-view that would actually do 200,000 on the money, at least according to WrestleNomics, that'd be Mayhem, which replaced World War III the month after. And I think Starcade 99 was down to 145,000. The last pay-per-view for WCW to hit 100,000 buys on the money was Bash at the Beach 2000. And then from there, I, I think they got, they actually had, I think Sin got like 80K and then Super Bowl Revenge, Super Brawl Revenge, easy for me to say, got 70,000. And then Greed got 50,000 pay-per-view buys. What a way to go out with a whimper. Okay, here are the rest of the Halloween Havoc figures before I dive into this goddamn mess of an atrocity. Uh, 1989, 7,300 fans in the Philly Civic Center, 175,000 pay-per-view buys. That was where Bruno San Martino was sick of all the bullshit that Vince McMahon was putting on, so he was the referee in that uh, Thunder Cage match where Muda had to put out the fire with his mist. That was cool. That was also the coolest thing about the match, unfortunately. 1990, 8,000 people dead even in the UIC Pavilion in Chicago. Okay, Chicago, hot crowd. Uh, 160,000 pay-per-view buys. You can thank Jim Hurt for that. God, I'm ashamed that Jim Hurt is still living, you fucking goddamn piece of shit. How dare you think that you were ever somebody that should have been in wrestling. 1991, the last Halloween Havoc under the Jim Hurt administration, had the infamous um, Chamber of Horrors match, and it also had Rick Rude as the Phantom. It had a lot of bullshit. You can thank Dusty's booking for that, and also Jim Hurd existing. But 8,900 fans, not all that bad, at the UTC Arena in Tennessee, and they were down to 120,000 pay-per-view buys. They were d d crashing, and it hurt inside. 1992, 7,000 fans. Okay, they dropped in quality, but they were just 300 off from 1989 at the Philly Civic Center. 165,000 pay-per-view buys. Good stuff. Cool. This is great. And then we get to 1993. 6,000 at the UNO Lakefront Arena in New Orleans, Louisiana. 100,000 pay-per-view buys. So let's just say that Watts got things up in 1992 and also made a lot of uh, questionable remarks. Hence why Heyman has that NDA clause. What belief system or what... You know, what, what background does Heyman have? What background do his parents have? Jewish? I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Would I be surprised if Bill Watts was anti-Semitic? No. No, I wouldn't. But anyway, because there's no way it wasn't, it was just other Turner executives and it wasn't just Watts hating Heyman. You had to think that he did. 
1994, Hogan had come in just a few months before. 14,000 people at the Joe Louis Arena. 210,000 pay-per-view buys to witness um, Beefcake Butcher in the friendship. And Mr. T is a referee handcuffed to the ropes in a steel cage match. And Sherry looked great, but Sherry always looked great. 1995, they were down to 13,000 in the Joe Louis Arena. 120,000 pay-per-view buys. The Yeti! Is that the head he's got on or a stump? I screwed up one of those words. Whatever. So, yeah. Facts and figures and all that stuff. And let's start with the pay-per-view proper now. <sighs> yeah, by the way, Fall Brawl 99 had 130,000 pay-per-view buys. Once again, shout out to Russell Nomics. 1998, that had the bullshit thing with, um, you know, the trap door that nobody got told about. And... Davy Boy Smith, the British Bulldog, suffered a back injury because nobody told them about the, you know, to avoid the trap door there. <laughs> Fuck the Ultimate Warrior, by the way. I'm glad he's dead. So, yeah, 275,000 pay-per-view buys. And they they lost half that, basically. Just a little over half that. And then things would just continue. <laughs> you know, the funniest thing is, actually, 230,000. <laughs> they, they did pretty well in Hall for Halloween Havoc. I'm a bit surprised, actually. But goddamn, there, there was like renewed interest. Like, okay, they got this stuff and Fall Brawl wasn't great, but we're going to buy into this. And <laughs> bid package on Sid and Goldberg and Hogan and Sting, um, which I wrote down as Hogan and Sid, probably because Sid was all over this goddamn show. So was Sting. There were a lot of people, on, there were a lot of stars, but they were all burned out. So a capacity crowd awaits the, awaits answers to the many questions over the past months, over the past weeks. Shivani pretty much summarizing how fans and people running the goddamn company felt about WCW. Shivani and Heenan welcomed us. Let me just say right now that it's a shame that Bobby Heenan was basically treated like a piece of shit in WCW. And there's an example of that a little bit later on here. Weasel, weasel chance. And there you go. Don't expect expert analysis as far as these matches go because none of the matches are any good. And there are good moments in them, but everything just dissolves into sloppiness or everything's really short and really quick and it's just this crash TV stuff that worked at times when you had a filter and Vince McMahon was the filter. <laughs> So, Ray is injured, so him and Conan, who just won the tag titles from Harlem Heat, must vacate the tag team championships. And then, the powers that be, not the powers to be, but the powers that be, Vince Russo off camera and whoever the hell else it was, I believe Creative Control or the Harris Brothers and various other people. <laughs> it's going to be a three-team street fight to determine new tag team champions. I want you to keep that in mind. <clears throat> Disco was dressed like a Zuba's cowboy. He was the cruiserweight champion at this point, just to prove how far the cruiserweight division had fallen. Lash LaRue was his opponent. Anyone remember Lash LaRue? Apparently he was a cartoonist and actually did some stuff for WCW Magazine, wrestled on the independents, and became a pastor. Um, whatever, religion is bullshit, but if it fixes you, I guess that works. So anyway... <clears throat> The the biggest story about this whole goddamn show was the crowd not giving a fuck about any of this. It's like they were, they all showed up drunk. They probably all got in there really cheap. I would imagine WCW probably took a bath on this. Because if you think, even in 98, the whole Norfolk scope, you know, that whole thing where DX and arrived in the tank, they were shooting the whole thing free tickets or whatever. You could get your tickets for free because they were just trying to paper the houses because even at that point... They were starting to really have issues, even though the ratings were so pretty goddamn good and the pay-per-view buy rates are good. And now they did 230000 they were just lucky to have that. But I bet at 8,400 people, which is, you know, basically half of what the goddamn capacity is, even if they had the top part, you know, the upper deck curtained off, it still wasn't very loud. And half the crowd must have been drunk. Half the crowd must have been high because the crowd was basically just all about getting either themselves over or just not caring. If you happen to be one of the people that were unfortunately in the crowd watching this, let me know if the atmosphere was as bad on the broadcast as it came across on TV. Because it just seemed 
at some points the crowd was trying to get into it, but it's like half half of them or more of them didn't know who the hell these people were except for the stars. And to be fair, nobody had been given a reason to care about Lash LaRue, even though he wasn't all that bad. He then became Corporal C Cajun and all that, and I'm avoiding talking about a Disco Inferno match because it's Disco fucking Inferno, that frog-faced Peter Griffin-sounding motherfucker that isn't nearly as entertaining as Peter Griffin on his worst day. He won with the last dance. <clears throat> this wasn't good. <clears throat> the sad thing is this wasn't the most egregious thing that we would see. It went about seven, seven and a half minutes. Lash LaRue lost. And this could have easily been on Thunder. <clears throat> and then, earlier today, Saturn is like, hey, we're part of this revolution. Revolution, by the way, was Saturn, Malenko, <clears throat> then it would later be Guerrero, Benoit, and Shane Douglas. Shane Douglas, who makes no appearance on this goddamn program, by the way, which is probably a good thing. But Benoit and Malenko apparently were in Japan, probably wrestling better people and for a better company than at this point. They got in WCW, that is. If that was English, I really would be surprised. And they blow off Saturn. And then we get Halloween-themed stuff, because Halloween Havoc. Jimmy Hart shows up in a monkey mask. Um, Brian Knobs, I thought, showed up in a mask, but really his face is so goddamn hideous, it's like a human death mask. But living, <clears throat> and Hugh Morris was also there. So Jimmy Hart's first family, that was Knobs and Hugh Morris, against Harlem Heat. And then against Kidman and Conan. Now, Conan was one half of the tag team champions, and they stripped him and Ray. So Conan and Kidman could team up to win the titles back. Why didn't you just let Kidman sub in on this because they weren't going <coughs> to... They weren't... <laughs> Vince Russo, ladies and gentlemen. There were two referees, by the way. This is a street fight for the vacant WCW Tag Team Championships. The plunder, as it, as it were, as if, if you will, keeps coming out. Trash cans and all this stuff, and they immediately separated because you got to keep them separated. Hey, hey. So basically, the filthy animals and, the, and one member of the first family, Hugh Morris, are in the ring. And Harlem Heat take Brian Noms, battle into the graveside area, battle to the back. Jimmy Hart tries to get a table, and bless Jimmy Hart, he... This is 1999. This is 24 years ago, and he he's like, what, 80 now? And he still has the same amount of energy, still looks great. Great youthful exuberance by Jimmy Hart. <laughs> and to think that he was in his mid-50s still doing this shit. I love Jimmy Hart. Some of my uh, Mount Rushmore uh, favorite managers of all time. Cornette, well, Heenan, Cornette, <laughs> Jimmy Hart, <sighs> Sherry, I guess. I mean, I don't know. Those three, and then uh, Gary Hart, maybe, but th those three for sure. And you could sub somebody else in. So anyway, yeah, they go into the greatest set, and then um, basically there's a, a, a styrofoam mummy used, and knobs is covered, one, two, three. Now, we see that, and then there's a moonsault that Hugh Morris had executed on Conan that hurt Conan's shoulder, and you could see him instantly grabbing his shoulder like, you fucking idiot. But then... Hugh Morris gets covered soon after this, so the Filthy Animals think they won the tag titles that they really shouldn't have been stripped of in the first place, but Harlem Heat win their 10th tag team championship because they got the cover before, because the other referee covered before this happened, and God, it was a mess, and this was not live on pay-per-view, pal. How many people requested refunds after um, this fiasco? I would have. I remember watching this, actually, at a friend's house because... Um, their parents would always order the pay-per-views, and holy shit, we were regretting watching this. Anyway, this was five minutes. This was a five-minute street fight, by the way. And then, yeah, we... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, off the rails already. This is off the rails already. Conan hurt his shoulder. Conan! And then Rick shows up with the crowbar. What Devin Storm did to deserve this, I don't think I'll ever know. Har, har. David Flair is also there. Mind you, David Flair had turned on Rick at, what, Super Brawl 99? Had become the U.S. champion, and then Rick was president for life and did all this stuff and was in an asylum. And all this stuff happened in a few months' time. And now Rick and David are back being friends. This is right before Rick would get buried in the desert by the filthy animals, which, again, was something that actually happened. WCW, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Rick shows up at the crowbar. Here's DDP and Kimberly to cut a long promo about Rick and David. Basically, Kimberly um, was seemingly assaulted by being spanked multiple times in a hotel room. This is something that was told 
in a lot more detail. Now, Kimberly was a beautiful woman. I ain't seen her wrestle, seen her box. But that's another, that's another story for another day. You like to spank it, don't you, nature boy? This was said and then hammered home. And DDP is a tremendous talent and a very good promo. But my God, it didn't seem like he gave a shit here. And I don't blame him. <coughs> and I've never seen Flair in a strap match. And then we would see him in another strap match a few months later when Vince Russo had been sent home and they had Kevin Sullivan do this shit. Goldberg was looking for Sid. Eddie apparently stole Rick, uh, Rick Flair's watch. And in Sarah and Eddie Guerrero, you would think this would be good. 11 minutes, these guys doing shit. No! Eddie was phoning it in, Saturn was phoning it in. My God, no wonder these guys left soon after. The crowd instantly shit on it. It's not like they shit on it after they saw that the match wasn't going to be that good. They shit on it, and that's probably why the match wasn't good. So, they were chanting, boring. Fuck you, Vegas, by the way. Hope you sink into the sand. <laughs> Rick shows up with Devin Storm. Har, har, the crowbar. And he ends up hitting Eddie with it after stomping him, and that's a DQ. And then Kidman shows up, Tori shows up, Ric Flair assaults Tori, who looks the same now as she did in 99. It's a goddamn miracle. <clears throat> Rick got his watch back from Heenan. Then we cut to Goldberg apparently pounding somebody. He was pounding the stagehand. No, he was beating up Sid. Sid, by the way, who had been the Millennium Man, had returned recently sometime in the summer, had won the, well, he had won the World Championship. He helped Savage, he helped Savage win the World Championship for a day. Hogan beat him. Savage had his last pay-per-view match, by the way, at, uh, against uh, Dennis Rodman at Road Wild 99. I retroviewed that, and that is his last pay-per-view match. I do not count the TNA stuff, and neither should you. So Sid had developed his own winning streak. The Millennium Man, his own win streak, and he would give Goldberg a shot at his U.S. title. Yes, 39-year-old fresh-faced Sid, and I love Sid. Sid's an intimidating son of a bitch, was the U.S. champion, and he would face... Goldberg, but said on a recent Nitro, you can't touch me, and then Goldberg speared him, and then Sid was in a giant suit, and ripped up a contract, and did stuff, and nobody knew what was going on, even if you watch this in real time. Sid's bleeding. Is that all you got? That all you got? He was bleeding pretty goddamn good, too. More on that later. And then, <clears throat> here's Buff Bagwell, unscheduled. He calls out Jeff Jarrett. This took a while. He did refer to the new writers from up north. And let me just say right now, Buff Bagwell isn't exactly one of my favorite wrestlers. But he did kind of get the shaft in WWF. I mean, the JR stuff about his mother calling him was kind of funny, kind of not. Um, Buff seemed to have turned his life around now. That's a good thing. But Buff, to think he had basically almost a 10-year career in WCW. Because <laughs> he started sometime in 91 and wrestled there until the very last show. And he calls Jeff Jarrett out. Jeff Jarrett, who had recently just left after No Mercy 99 and putting over China. And the good house queefing match. I think that's what it was called. And then <clears throat> they had a brawl that sadly for a couple minutes, was actually the best thing on the show. For me to say Jeff Jarrett had the best thing on the show, considering some of the shit he's doing in AEW now, is saying something. And then here's Lex Luger. And then Lex Luger completely brings us down by taking the guitar and saying, oh, this handle's too tight, Billy. And he hits Buff Bagwell, who previously had an injured neck with the handle. Didn't even know Kabong him. There, that's all I got to say about that. Sid is bleeding, yelling at Mike Tanay. Eddie is on the phone in a stairwell, seemingly in the Bronx. And he's just yelling at him. Whoa, at him. He's just yelling and yelling and yelling and yelling. And even the producer doesn't want to chime in. Because the producer says, I don't want to talk about Eddie yelling on a stairwell. And then Brad Armstrong faced off against Berlin with a Y. Um... <clears throat> No, not the group Berlin. Was there a group named Berlin? Was that Take My Breath Away? A.K.A. what Benoit did to Nancy and Daniel? Oh, this is going well. The wall came crumbling down. The wall was there. The wall who handled his opponents with malice and hasn't handled any opponents in about 20-something years. That's mean. That's really mean. <clears throat> they gave... Uh, he went from Alex Wright to Alex Reich. This apparently was an idea that uh, Alex Wright had to reinvent himself. He became Berlin. He had a 
mo black mohawk thing. And he was going to be almost Columbine-like. And then the Columbine tragedy happened. So they delayed his push for a bit. And then Duggan didn't want to work with him at Fall Brawl. Buff Bagwell didn't want to work. Well, actually, let me try that again. Buff Bagwell didn't want to work with him. <laughs> and then Duggan worked with him. And nobody knew what the hell was going on. And the Berlin character was doomed from the start. A USA chant. No one cared. Um, he tried for a rude awakening variation. And... Brad held under the ropes. Brad Armstrong got a victory on pay-per-view in 1999. That shows you the state of WCW right there. Nothing against Brad Armstrong, but he should have been there to put people over, at least with his presentation. And then both those guys beat him up afterwards. And I don't think the Berlin character lasted for more, you know, except inconsistent television appearances. I think he was gone pretty much by, like, spring of 2000. He showed back up in the fall of 2000. And Alex Wright, it's no wonder he didn't want to stay in a U.S. wrestling company after this. And he was only 24 at this point. Or 25. I think maybe he was 25. I don't remember. So, anyway, today is with Flair. <coughs> Woo! And Kim Ballet! Woo! That's a lot of stuff. Talking about a strap match. And then Benoit took on Rick Steiner for the TV championship. And I'm going to say the same thing I say about Benoit matches. They're difficult to watch. And Benoit... I don't, um, this was the longest match on the card, and look, the match, even if Benoit wasn't a murderer, this match would have been impossible to sit through as it is. And it felt twice as long as it was, and it went about 13 minutes. Um, Benoit does a dive, Rick phones it in, stalls, does rest holds, later a chair gets involved, after Benoit tries to pick it up, we get a ref bump, the chair, the chair is brought up by, you know, chair is brought out again, Dean Malenko then hits... Benoit with the chair, because why not turn? Because why not? Rick Steiner wins the TV championship, and then soon after, Scott Hall would win it, throw it in the trash, and Jim Duggan would become the TV champion by fishing it out of the trash when he was a janitor months later. That was something that actually happened, by the way. Mike Tanea is with Bret Hart. He has a bad ankle. It's from trying to carry this bad booking. The total package, by the way, with Liz, motherfucking Christ, Miss Elizabeth looked tremendous. So, Bret Hart, Lex Luger. Bret Hart beats the shit out of Lex Luger until we get a hip toss part where Bret's selling his ankle. No, me ankle hurts so much. <coughs> and then Lex Luger beats him. Lex Luger hit him with a bat earlier, like poking him with a bat. Boop, boop. I'm going to poke you with a bat. Bat's too tight, Billy. And then, yeah, so Brett had a bad ankle, and then Luger got a um, single-leg crab, and Brett tapped out. Bret Hart tapped out to Lex Luger in a match in 1999. Yeah, Lex Luger deserves to not walk after that. Look, I stand by everything I said about Lex Luger. Yes, Liz was an adult and got into the party and everything. Lex Luger could have easily done something about it because that 911 call proved that he... He was, he was complicit. He was complicit. I'm not saying he's responsible. He deserves every bit of karma he got. Check out my Lex Luger WWE Legends biography, whatever the fuck goddamn title that is. Check out the Lex Luger biography review that I did. So anyway, <coughs> the crowd booed this whole thing, by the way. They were booing this whole show. Goldberg <coughs> says he's going to separate Sid's head from his body. And then Medusa shows up in a uh, bathing suit type things and dumps, or she looks great, by the way, dumps Nitro Cologne on Heenan. A indicator of how they felt about him at the time. Recaps of Sting turning on Hogan at Fall Brawl 99, which was dumb. And then American Made plays for like three minutes and then Sting's music plays and he comes out. Hogan comes out in street clothes. I am rushing through this stuff because... It, it's melting my brain to think about it, to relive any of it. And I just got done watching this thing about 35 minutes ago. Comes out in street clothes. And it's supposed to be for the World Heavyweight Championship. Hogan's going to get his revenge, but Sting turned on him and all this and everything. And Hogan looks at Sting, lays down, bell rings, Sting covers one, two, three. And Hogan gets up and leaves. And then they recreate this at Bash at the Beach 2000. But Hogan doesn't want to do the job. He wants Jared to do the job. And none of the fakes that he sucks. And Sting is still the world champion. Is any wonder why Sting seemed like he was just checked out of WCW, even though he was the franchise of WCW, and they did shit like this with him? 
Goldberg then took on Sid. Uh, the, the entrances were longer than the match, by the way. Sid had his cut kind of taped up. This is for the U.S. title. Sid, the own, his own streak, a Millennium Man, and after Nash and Hall jumped Goldberg during his entrance and a brief flurry by Sid, Goldberg pretty much dominates this thing. We get the steel steps. We get boom, 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 boom. You know, Sid's cut gets busted open again, <laughs> or, you know, opened up again. And he's bleeding, he's bleeding a lot. I mean, the blood ain't bothering me, but he's bleeding a lot. And then they... <laughs> it looks like Goldberg's acting more heelish. In fact, I think had he not been stupid, I'm going to put my hand through the window, they might have actually turned him heel in the beginning of 2000. You know what? That might have actually worked. Not the way Russo did it, but this... Because he's more vicious. We get a referee stoppage. And Goldberg's a new U.S. champion. Because Sid's on his knees and he's all out of it. <laughs> That's one way to, I guess, protect Sid. Ray or Rick Steiner to stop uh, Sid because they'd been associates as recently as a couple months ago. And we got uh, footage of Kimberly in the hotel looking great. Boy, one thing about her, she looked great. So, here's Sting. He wants a match tonight. He wants to fight somebody. Then he leaves. Then Flair and DDP have a strap match that goes on for about 12 and a half, maybe 13 minutes, and felt like it went on for 30. This was sluggish. They battle into the crowd. And I like DDP. Flair was totally checked out by this point. <laughs> the crowd was dead. DDP ends up eventually hitting a diamond cutter on Rick, gets the cover, one, two, three, Seems pissed to Charles like it wasn't a convincing count. Hits a diamond cutter on Charles. David Flair gets involved, has the crowbar. Devin Storm gets thrown in the goddamn ring by Kimberly. And then after David gets laid out with the diamond cutter, Rick gets the crowbar right to the goddamn nuts. And then they do a stretcher job. And then Flair is taken to the back. And then the filthy animals attack him, knock out David Flair, and take <coughs> Flair in the ambulance. Throw him in there and steal it because, of course, Turner was going to have the Hispanic steal a uh, government vehicle. Great, great, you know, relations there, I guess. I don't know where I was going with that. They want to call it an international object, yet they have something like that happen because the filthy animals are heels, I guess. And then they buried Ric Flair in the desert soon after. And then Sting comes out and says, by the way, this is going to be non-title. And then Goldberg beats him, even after Sting hits a spear. This went three minutes. This went three minutes. The main event of this pay-per-view went three minutes. <laughs> he hit three Stinger splashes, gets hit with a spear, a jackhammer, one, two, three. The commentary team was told this is non-title. And then they said, and new world champion, Bill Goldberg, because he won the title, despite it being non-title. Vince Russo needs to be brought up on capital charges and thrown in jail for what he did to professional wrestling. Halloween Havoc 99, ladies and gentlemen. And it only got worse from here. Check out my reviews of that. Anyway, agree, disagree, what I said, like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Ritland. Fuck Vince Russo. Fuck his parents for giving birth to him. See you soon.